Welcome back. One tiny Caribbean nation took a huge step towards gaining full independence and ended over 300 years of British rule. The island of Barbados recently removed Queen Elizabeth II as head of state and inaugurated the island's first president. Here to talk to us about what this means for the new republic is Dr. Keisha Allen, postdoctoral associate at the LACS Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So to understand why this ceremony is monumental, we should look back. Over 390 years of British rule means Barbados, as with many other countries, were slaves as a result of colonization. We'll now turn to a clip of Prince Charles addressing this. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history, the people of this island forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. Emancipation, self-government, and independence were your waypoints. Freedom, justice, and self-determination have been your guides. Dr. Allen, can you just tell us more about the history of slavery in the Caribbean? Sure. So when you think about the history of slavery, you think of European colonization. Um, Europeans came to Caribbean in search of wealth, in search of gold and silver, and they were unsuccessful in their attempts to find gold and silver. So they turned their attention to growing crops such as tobacco, and they eventually tried to grow sugar cane, which was not a local plant, but it grew well after its introduction. So there was a need for workers for these sugar plantations, and Africans were forcibly brought to the Caribbean to work on these plantations. And when you think of the transatlantic slave trade, it's the largest form of um, forced migration in history. So we have to acknowledge that history, that brutal history, of course, the atrocity of, of slavery um, that Prince Charles acknowledged. But I think it's important to move beyond that acknowledgement and offer a formal apology. I think an apology is it's great, it's a good start, but also reparations are also necessary as well. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that was going to lead into my next thing, like what were your thoughts, but you feel that there should actually be an apology to follow that. Yes, definitely a form of apology and acknowledgement is great, but I feel there should be a move beyond just an acknowledgement because we all acknowledge that this atrocity occurred, but there should be some formal apology to these countries, to the descendants of Africans who are, you know, obviously the brutal treatment they endured, the inhumane treatment. I think there should be a formal apology. And that is what I think was missing there. Now, uh, Democracy Now! reports that this move comes as a call grows for the United Kingdom to pay reparations, which you kind of just spoke on a little bit. Can you tell us what would uh, reparations look like for countries in the Caribbean? Because we hear this a lot um, in talks about reparations, but that's usually for the U.S. So what would that look like for the Caribbean? Um, well, reparations can take several forms. For example, it could be the form of debt cancellation, illiteracy eradication, sharing of technology and science. In terms of debt cancellation, European nations can support Caribbean countries in terms of their domestic and international debt. Because when you think of colonialism um, and the results of it, Caribbean countries were left in a state of poverty and they were unprepared for development. So I think it's incumbent upon European countries to assist in this regard, to assist in terms of debt cancellation, also in terms of illiteracy eradication, because um, as a result of colonization, Black and Indigenous populations were left illiterate. So this illiteracy problem that was as a result of colonialism, I think it should be addressed. There should be efforts to eradicate illiteracy and then in terms of technology and science sharing, that's another possible form of reparations because Caribbean countries were denied participation in European industrialization because they were confined to the role of producers of raw materials for Europe. So I think technology sharing, science sharing would be another possible way in which reparations can perhaps take place. All right, well, thank you so much for you know giving giving me that. That was really insightful. Um, going back to Barbados, they gained independence 55 years ago. Um, and as we all know, the island recently made headlines becoming a republic. Can you explain what is the difference between just gaining independence and then becoming a republic? Sure. So in terms of Barbados with independence, 
that means that the country has control over its own political affairs. There's a prime minister, and the prime minister presides over the cabinet, but the queen remains the ceremonial head of state. But in a republic, the queen is no longer the head of state, and a president is appointed. And in the case of Barbados, the president is now Sandra Mason. And when you think about it, it's an important psychological achievement because now any Barbadian can aspire to become head of state. Wow. So Barbados is also home to global pop star Rihanna, as we all know, uh, who was just honored as a national hero during that ceremony. Over the years, the pop star, the pop star promoted education and tourism to the island. How was that influence helpful to such a small nation? Oh, I definitely think it was certainly helpful. When you think of Rihanna, she was a cultural ambassador. Um, she was appointed cultural ambassador in 2018, and she's also a devoted member of the Global Partnership for Education, which works to eradicate um, or bring so education to underserved communities. So I think financially, there are definitely benefits. Rihanna has millions of followers on her social media platforms, and she showcases Caribbean culture, Barbadian culture to her followers. And I think it will draw attention to the island, definitely bring more tourists. As you know, Barbados, the economy relies on tourism. So there are definitely benefits of having her um, as a national hero and the attention it, it will bring to Barbados, to the island, the tourists that it will hopefully bring as well. So we talked a little bit about slavery and colonization, but can you explain this relationship that many Caribbean and even Latin countries have with, you know, some of these larger nations? Sure. When you think about this relationship, um, it's all about colonialism. These countries were producers of raw material for Europe, and they saw themselves as servants for the British, the Spanish, the French, and the Dutch. So there is this psychology of being servants for Britain, servants for the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch. And when you think about that power dynamic where the powerful dominate the powerless, and you know the importance of sort of cutting ties with this colonial mother country, um, and you think of Barbados, Barbados was known as Little England because Barbados remained um, in British control from 1655 until 1966. So when you think of Barbados, you think of countries that have cut ties with this colonial mother country. It's an important psychological achievement, sort of moving forward, sort of shaking off the, the yoke of colonialism and the shackle of colonialism. So when you think of that, you think of that history of being sort of servants, producing raw material for Britain and for these other European nations, I think moving forward and sort of moving beyond that colonial past is important. Now, Barbados intends to remain part of the Commonwealth. Uh, can you just explain what does that mean? Well, that pretty much means that they remain close to a group of countries that share similar histories, histories of British colonialism. And this 54-member organization of countries, they work together to foster international trade and international cooperation. So it really means creating stronger ties with these countries that have similar histories. Okay, so now that Barbados is a republic, what does this mean if they were to ever run into, let's say, a natural disaster or any invasions? Will they no longer receive support from a powerful country like Britain? Um, when I think of support, I think of regional support. I think that would be important, receiving support from other Caribbean countries, Caribbean nations. I know Caribbean countries in the past have rendered aid in times of crisis, in times of natural disasters. And I think they may form stronger bonds with Caribbean Latin American nations so that they can look to themselves for aid rather than looking to the colonial, the imperial countries for um for aid. So I think it's important to foster stronger ties within the region and that the region should work together to support each other in times of crisis. Now, what does it look like for islands in the Caribbean to be under the rule of another country? And this makes me think of, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, how it's considered a territory and the United, St in the United States. Can you explain that a little bit? Right. Well, Puerto Rico was first a colony of Spain, and then the U.S. took possession of Puerto Rico in 1898 in the Spanish-American War. And since 1917, Puerto Ricans have 
um, been American citizens. But when you think of Puerto Rico in particular, Puerto Rico is a political paradox because it is American, but yet it's distinct from America. They don't enjoy the full benefits of citizenship, and then there isn't full representation. So there is this paradox there that's very particular to Puerto Rico that I think must be highlighted, that political paradox paradox and that sort of space of being American, but yet being Caribbean, this liminal space, I would say, um, and also the fact that there's a full representation that causes, that makes Puerto Rico stand out as a bit different from other Caribbean countries. Thank you so much. So Australia, Canada, Jamaica, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea are among the nations that still call the queen their head of state. What would it mean for Britain if these countries gained their full independence? Well, I think it would mean for Britain that they will lose their political influence, their political clout, because the queen will no longer be the ceremonial head of state. But I think it's important to really look at what it would mean for these countries as well, the psychological achievement and the fact that they will be cutting ties with this um, colonial mother country. So I think for Britain, of course, definitely not having the queen as a head of state politically, that influence is lost. But for these countries as well, it's an important achievement. It's moving forward, moving beyond the colonial past. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. I really learned a lot today. Can you tell people where they can just keep in contact with you or your center? Sure. So we had a Latin American and Caribbean Studies Center. So you can reach us um, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, on our social media platforms. And also you can um, email me directly, kallen1 at umd.edu. So it really has been a pleasure to share my thoughts on this really um, amazing day for the Caribbean, in particular for Barbados, following the legacy of countries like Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana and Dominica. So it's great to be here with you all and thanks for inviting me. And I look forward to future discussions. All right. Thank you. Thank we'll you. be right back with more Open BXRX Tuesday.